Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Just Ship It. Today I have Mishko Hevery over here with us. Thanks for joining us, Mishko. Thank you for having me, Tracy. Yes, and um, I don't know, people lovingly refer to you in the Angular world as Papa Mishko. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure how that came about. <laughs> But, uh, you know, you're well known for creating uh, AngularJS and Angular and now Quick. Um, yeah, I just seem to cannot stop. It's, a, yeah. it's an affliction. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, you know, maybe we can start with just like what drive, like why do you, why do you want to create these things? Like what, from the beginning, like is there a trend between creating like AngularJS and Angular and Quick? I mean, at the end of the day, I think what drives the whole thing is you just want to make your life easier, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I used to build web applications and with web applications, you very quickly realize that every single page that you build is essentially the same. It's a big marshalling problem of how to get data from the database to the user and from the user back into the database, right? Like that's what a web application basically is. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, after a while, you want to simplify this problem. And so, you know, for your own laziness, right, you want to come up with, with things to make it simpler. And so if you <coughs> look at what AngularJS is and Angular and Quick and all these, actually all the frameworks in general, it, they solve the problem of how to get the data from, uh, some, you know, from, from the heap of the memory, from the browser's memory to the user, to the UI, and back to the browser's memory. And then there's a second kind of generation of frameworks, which we call meta frameworks, which basically say it's not just about getting the data from the browser's memory to the user and back to the memory. It's actually a, a problem of getting it from the database to the browser, from the browser to the UI, and then all the way back, right? So, so meta frameworks basically solve the, the other part of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, gosh, when did AngularJS start? When did well, you I remember go? that. It started a, a year before my firstborn was born. He was born in 2010. And I remember that because I remember thinking, like, I got to get this finished before he's born. That's so funny because that's how I feel right now about this book I'm writing. Like, all right, we got a few months. Uh, better, <laughs> better give birth to this book first. Um, okay, so let's see. It's 2023 now, right? So it's like yeah. 13, 13 years, 13 years. 20, 13 years later, right? And I'm still yeah. Yeah. kind of trying to solve the problem of how to marshal data from the database to the user in a most efficient way. Um, yeah. And I think the, the efficiency is kind of what, what comes into play because you, you learn along the way and you realize, hey, there are better ways of the, these certain things can be done. Yeah. Well, I mean, starting from AngularJS, because I know people think of AngularJS and, you know, you know, sometimes these things just kind of appear out of nowhere, right? Like, whoa, look at this cool thing that Google's doing. Everybody's using it at Google. We should obviously adopt it. Now there's hundreds of millions of people using it. Um, how did the how did it start with AngularJS? Like, yeah, so it is interesting because AngularJS originally, my original goal was to say, hey, how can we make it easier for non-developers to build web applications? And so the idea is like, hey, <clears throat> there's a lot of people who know HTML, you know, maybe if we can extend the vocabulary of HTML with extra tags or extra things, then um, those people could build applications. Now, the thing I kind of realized afterwards is that there is more to building applications than just knowing the syntax of the language. You really have to think as a developer, right? You have to think about how do I break down the application down and how do I store the data and how do I normalize it, et cetera. And it turns out those skills are essentially skills that developers need to, do, to have. So it's not just about making the syntax easier. But in any case, uh, this is where, I, where it started. And it turns out that making life easier for non-developers also makes it easier for developers as well. And I think that's the reason why AngularJS became popular. It was it was at a time when it was one of the first um, kind of an end-to-end -end frameworks. I mean, there were frameworks before that, but they didn't, they didn't really solve the problem end-to-end. -end. And AngularJS also was very heavy on, on syntax in the sense that of making it super easy, expressive, declarative for the developer to, to express themselves. And I think those th themes together uh, made it 
so that the adoption just, just took off, uh, surprising everybody, including ourselves. Yeah. So um, in a large organization like, you know, this was born out of Google, right? You know, now there's a whole Angular team. I mean, mm-hmm. how did it go from just an idea to all of a sudden there's an entire like org associated with this Yeah, technology. so definitely a lot of people had to take chances. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I was kind of working on it kind of in my free time. Mm-hmm. And at one point I was working with, with uh, internally at Google, I was working on an application uh, that, that was built using Google Web Toolkit, which basically meant that was built in Java and transpiled to JavaScript. And I was lamenting just how slow the process was, how, how much effort it took to do anything, add anything. Things were not declarative. The, the turnaround time was measured almost in minutes. Um, and so as a result, the, the speed at which you were progressing on making an application was very slow. And so I kind of showed people like, hey, I have this other crazy idea. You know, Instead of imperatively writing code, could we just declaratively add extra things into the HTML? <clears throat> to make it possible for developers to kind of express themselves. And I used that to kind of put together a bunch of prototypes and demos, etc. And people really were impressed by just the, the speed at which you could add new features and how quickly the turnaround was, how you know you could just change some text and refresh the browser and all of a sudden you would see the new behavior that you just did. And that's essentially what made it, um, you know, but, but, but allowed people to kind of really uh, take instant liking to, to AngularJS. And I think what kind of made it popular. And so at the beginning, um, you know, um, our manager, Brad Green, kind of said, you know, this is kind of idea worth exploring. Let's, you know, put two people on this thing full time. And, and over time, the, the project grew. You know, it started with us just trying to build something for ourselves, just to make our application more productive. But at some point, um, you know, others heard about it in the company and they said, hey, you know, this is interesting. Can we also try it as well? And so <clears throat> we started sharing it with others. And at the same time, we also uh, did it open source so that, you know, outside world can do it. I mean, put together a web page. And I remember on this web page, the demo was essentially a to-do list, right? And it was to-do list, mostly like 90% of to-do list was actually done in HTML, you know, declaratively in it. And I think... And also there was like a filter, so you could like type in a, a string and then the list would just, you know, shorten itself just only to the items that were in the text. And I think it blew people's mind because they were like, hey, wait, I didn't write any JavaScript. I just wrote a bunch of things, declarative relationships between things, and the UI just updates. Like, that's amazing. Um, and people just kind of became you know, obsessed with it and kind of became popular. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love that. So, I mean, it just started off with just you trying to make it easier for... Non-developers or develop, yeah, and it's just, and then, you know, I never knew that Brad Green was there from the beginning. That's, that's kind of awesome too. Wow. (laughs) And then uh, what about Angular? Like, uh, you know, was there different reasons for starting Angular? What was driving that? Yeah, so we put together AngularJS, it became popular. And the thing is that when we built put together AngularJS, none of us were AngularJS experts. And I guess you could argue that at the time, nobody really was AngularJS expert, right? Angular, uh, Java, sorry, not AngularJS, JavaScript expert. Uh, you know, nobody really was a JavaScript expert. And as a result, we did things best we knew at the time and realized like many things, many choices we did were suboptimal. <clears throat> and so uh, we wanted to kind of, you know, fix our mistakes, so to speak. And so we said like, hey, you know, let's, let's fix these things. And let's make a new version of of angular js but it turns out that you know when you're building a new version um you know it's a feature grip you want to fix a couple of things but all of a sudden like you might as well fix this other thing and this other thing and this other thing and next thing you know it's a brand new thing all you know all from the beginning um in retrospect i think the fact that we we built this new thing that was supposed to fix the old mistakes what we didn't realize (coughs) is that the importance of of uh, not having breaking changes, right? And Angular was definitely a very hard breaking change. Um, so you didn't us, realize yeah. the importance of not having breaking changes until you yeah. released Angular? 
until we released and then we got feedback from people and then we understood like, oh, that makes totally sense, right? If you build a whole application that's super complicated on top of AngularJS and now the, the Angular team releases a new version that's incompatible, right? like you can't just move over. Yeah. Right? Okay. The migration story is huge. Um, yeah. And I think that, that speaks to us as, you know, naive developers in the sense that like, hey, we just wanted to fix the mistakes we saw. Yeah. We didn't really understand the consequences of it, right? Yeah. So if you look at it like, you know, the, the typical uh, QWERTY layout of the keyboard, right? You know, there's good arguments to be made that, that that's not the best layout and other layouts are better. Um, and so you could just say like, oh, let's just fix the layout, right? But what you're not kind of realizing is that like, yes, but there are millions of people out there who've already learned QWERTY. And so what you're asking them to do is to be uh, a horrible typist for the next two years where they relearn, you know, Dvorak or some other uh, keyboard layout. And that's a cost that most people are just unwilling to pay because, um, yes, you, you know, Dvorak keyboard might be better, but is it that much better? Right? Like, let's say it's 20% better. Let's say, is, it, is it worth the trouble for 20%? Yeah. You know? So yeah. I think... When you go through and you want to adopt a brand new system, I think you have to have a 10x kind of a improvement, right? Like it really has to make a lot of sense for it to be worth it. And I think that is the mistake we've made. It's like we didn't fully understood this. Yeah, that's so funny because what you just said there, I was interviewing Jeff Cross the other day and I think he said exactly the same thing. I'm pretty sure it's Jeff. Like if you make something now, it can't be incrementally better. It has to be... 10x better otherwise you know what's the point of making it an adoption right because the cost like you you know if you just starting from zero nothing and you know this is 20 percent better than this then clearly you choose the better one but if you're not starting from zero you're starting from an existing system where you're already buried deep in it you can't just like flip over for 20 percent. that's just yeah. not a thing okay wait so there were no breaking changes in angular js uh, I mean, there were breaking changes, but they were minor. There were changes that uh, the teams could, you know. Like the upgrade path was like small. Yeah, like, you know, yeah. oh, like, oh, this API changed or whatever. So you like look for five instances in your code base and you fix it, right? Yeah. Whereas if you go to Angular, all of a sudden everything's different. The syntax is different. Right. <clears throat> the, the layout of the files is different. Mm -hmm. The way you structure components is different. So you can't just like take existing code and move it over because the way the new code looks is nothing like what the old code looked. Do you feel so like it's 10x no better? What's it 10x? Oh, looking back, hindsight, 2020, was it 10x better? Uh, Angular? No. Yeah. I don't think it's 10x better. Um, and I think, I think in, in general, what we're seeing right now is that all the frameworks <clears throat> that you have out there, whether it's AngularJS, React, Swell, Vue, et cetera, they're all fundamentally the same. There are not... There isn't a 10x better. And I, and I think this is the reason why I think uh, we are pushing on Quick is because Quick is a fundamentally different approach. You know, it's not a different syntax. It's just like complete rethink about how the sub stuff works. Yeah. Right. So if you look at AngularJS versus React, they work under the hood the same way. The syntax is very different, you know, but under the hood, the way it works is pretty much the same. Um, and because it works the same way, there are the same kind of implications in terms of performance and speed, et cetera, and <clears throat> um, mainly the startup performance and the amount of JavaScript that you need. So if you look at today on the web, you know, if you go to the HTTP archive, you can see um, how well different frameworks perform on uh, Google PageSpeed scores. And you'll see that most frameworks are pretty much in the same ballpark. There is very little difference. The only one that really stands out is obviously Quick and Astro. But Astro is not a general purpose framework. You know, it's great for building uh, static content websites with Astro. But if you want to have a very complicated interactive application <clears throat> with Astro, it, it, that's, it's not going to be that simple. Right. So um, with, with Angular, so you're, I mean, you were doing mm -hmm. Angular for what, seven years, six years, five years, something like that? Uh, AngularJS or Angular? Angular. About five years or six years. Yeah. That sounds about right. So it's like, 
Angular JS for what six, five, six, seven years, something uh, let's like say that. five years of Angular JS and another five years of of uh, Angular, like you know, yeah. Possibly. So you have the five year itch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so then you know, then going. I mean, you know, I don't think anybody ever thought you would leave the Angular team or Google. <laughs> And then you did. <laughs> wow. Um, what was the uh, what was the reason for that? It's you like, know, oh after gosh. you do something, I was at Google for 16 years. Mm -hmm. And that's a very long time. Yeah. And, you know, after 16 years, I think you almost owe it to yourself to leave. Yeah. Because if you don't, then you're going to be stuck in the, in the same old ways forever. Right. Yeah. And so to me, um, you know, either, either I was going to become institutionalized and I'm going to retire at Google or yeah. you know, like, hey, there is a whole new world of other things to explore and learn and, and, and build. And so yeah. I um, <clears throat> started, you know, kind of exploring and going. And I actually did not want to build another framework. Oh, yeah? <laughs> that was not my goal. That was not my goal. And yet somehow I fell into it. How and did you fall into it? into it? Because as I said, you know, like, I think... All the frameworks are the same. They work the same way under the hood. The syntax is different, you know. the The look and feel of the of the templating, etc., is different, but fundamentally they work the same way. And and so Quick is different in a, in a, in the sense that I would say like, well, what would the world look like if you wanted to minimize the amount of JavaScript that you're sending to the client, right? Like, how would everything have to change? And so I kind of started exploring that particular thing. And I realized that like, hey, this is so significantly different. Like the world needs this. I, I felt almost like an obligation, you know, to be like, hey, you know, we're building the, the apps in the same exact way and we're having all these performance issues. And if you look at uh, Google page speed, you know, like m almost all websites that are real production websites that run real, you know, money through it, <clears throat> they do not perform very well. They're slow, they're clunky, etc. Um, there's a lot of advice on how to make the sites better, but they all fall on in, in a sense of like the, the <coughs> developer's responsibility. And the philosophy that I wanted to have with Quick is like, no, 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 performance is not developer's responsibility. Performance is the framework's responsibility, you know? And, and this, it's a kind of a mind shift. Like, you know, in many frameworks, it's like, oh, you build the thing and, you know, after you get it to some size, then you have to go and do special performance optimization hacks, right? The way you write code to make it work and the way you write code to make it performant are not the same thing in, in all the frameworks or the vast majority of the frameworks, right? And so, you know, you don't fall into success. You have to fight for success in these frameworks. And so with Quick, I wanted to basically say like, no, 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 the two should be the same, right? You, as a developer, shouldn't have to spend time thinking like, how do I lazy download this thing? How do I lazy execute this thing? How do I make sure that I don't have to do all this code and initialization of my application, right? Like those are things that, you know, we have best practices to kind of improve the way your application performs. But at the end of the day, I think it's, it's a failure of the framework. Like the framework just shouldn't let you get there. Um, and so, this is kind of what's kind of a different about Quick, and I guess this is why I kind of felt like the world kind of needed this <laughs> because it's it's a it's a fundamentally different approach to building apps. It's so funny because I I just think about like Angular conferences and lazy loading and talking about performance and you know like all the workshops that anybody wants to go to now. Yeah. Then what are you know if you do a Quick conference, what do you talk about? Because everything's <laughs> done for you. About. There's yeah. always stuff to talk about. <laughs> Um, but you know, you know, lazy loading is a good example, right? Like there are so many workshop and explanations and discussions and article written about what is the best way to do lazy loading. And yet we still have the problem of large applications, right? Whereas in quick, everything's lazy loaded. And as a developer, you don't have to do anything and there's no effort whatsoever on you. So, uh, yeah, it would be kind of hard to have a, uh, I mean, there's probably a talk in there somewhere about how lazy loading works or whatever and how to like, you know, do things with it. But like for the most part, there isn't a talk like, 
you should lazy load. Of course you should. Yeah. Like it's just what the framework does, right? Like, or, you know, yeah. you should prefetch your code. Like, of course you should like, but that's just what the framework does. There's nothing to do for you. I think, that's, I think that's the big thing, right? Like it shouldn't yeah. be the responsibility of the developer. The developer's responsibility is to make the application, not to spend <coughs> endless hours trying to optimize the thing. Yeah. And it's not even that. If you look at applications, what you see is that they, you build the big applications and, and at some point they get slow. And so now it's like a couple of months of like many developers optimizing it and they get it into a good state. And then they go back to building features and the whole thing just devolves over the next few months again into a bad state. And then, uh, you know, half, six months later, you're like, well, we're slow again. Let's have another effort to kind yes, of fix it. Yes, yes, yes. And then it's hard to get, you know, stakeholders usually want to um, ship features, not focus on performance. Yeah. And you have to have that. And I think, I think that one of the biggest things, at least in my, you know, few years of talking about web performance is very much like, how do you get, how do you convince the people who hold the budgets to actually spend time on web performance? And even though you can show them, hey, you look, look at this and look how much money you're losing. Sometimes it's, it doesn't click for some reason, right? So I don't know. Nobody ever but really wants to build cycles. But it's also a lot of work. Cycles. Yeah. It's also a huge amount of work. And um, the benefits are kind of questionable in the sense that there are limits to what you can do as a developer with today's frameworks. Like right. hydration requires that all the code is eagerly done. If, if a component is visible, hydration says, I need to execute the code to see if there is a click listener in that location, right? And so, you know, you can't really lazy load that. You can't really delay execute it. Like the, the more complicated your page becomes, the more work there is to kind of get the application up and running. And there is not much you can do as a developer because of the fundamentally how the framework works. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. it's it's really fun to see Quick being built because I guess you've been working on it for what three years now ish, two three years. About three years, yeah. Kind three of years. years. Oh, time just flies by. I know. I know. <laughs> so with that, you know, like I I feel like, well, I mean, you're you're three years into your five year journey. <laughs> <laughs> I think this one might take a little bit longer because it's starting from starting from a different place uh, for you to it's, get bored. It's much harder, yeah, <laughs> yeah, because you know a lot of times when people come and compare frameworks, they have mm -hmm. a mental model of how frameworks work, and mm -hmm. really what they're comparing is syntax, and they're really just saying, "Do I like it this way or do I like it that way? Do I like my JSX or do I want my file and a template HTML thing? You know, <clears throat> yeah. where do I want to put the JavaScript, etc." But when you come to Quick. We worked so hard to make it look like a popular framework like React. Yeah. People look at it and they're like, oh, it's just like React. They already have React. Like, I don't care for this. Yeah. You know, it's so hard to explain, like, this intentionally looks like React. Yeah. But the way it works underneath it is very, very different. Um, and what's yeah. also difficult is to be like, hey, I built a Hello World app in all these mm. frameworks, right? And it's about all, about all of them are about the same in terms of performance and all about the same in terms of the amount of effort it took to build. So you think they're about the same. What mm -hmm. you don't see is what happens when you throw, you know, 50 people at the problem and you have a million lines of code and you have this humongous application. How does the performance hold up then? Yeah, yeah. Because right? that's not a hello world. That's like a real production site. Yeah. <clears throat> and this is where the differences really come to shine. So the, the place where you can reap the benefits of, of this new approach is not early on. It's it's it happens later on in the life cycle. Hmm. But I think people are realizing this. I think there is a there's a lot of renewed interest and discussion and etc. Of you know like how do we improve the cost of hydration? Right. Mm -hmm. There are people who talk about partial hydration, islands, uh, lazy hydration. Um, you know hydration. You know as needed. Prioritizing the order of hydration, etc. And here is quick being kind of on the extreme end of it and say like, how about we just don't do hydration? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Um, but, but the reason why people are having these discussions about hydration is because people are recognizing that, hey, this is a problem. Maybe we should do more stuff at the server. Maybe we should do React server components or maybe we should, you know, have islands that some parts is server only and some things are client only, you know. These are all different experiments that are happening uh, in the ecosystem right now. And it shows that 
the ecosystem is ready for this. You know, the, mm -hmm. the ecosystem, the, the industry is recognizing that this is a problem, right? Because if hydration wasn't a problem, then you wouldn't see this alternate solutions to it. Yeah. Right? Uh, and so because you see it, it means like people are recognizing and, are, and they're, they're seeing it as a problem and they're trying to figure out an alternative way to do it. I still remember, uh, you know, I, st I started in Ember before Angular kind of took over my took over yeah, my Ember, world. Ember. And I still remember most of the talks because, you know, Ember has this add on community. So you, they, they were called Ember add ons at the time. I think the site is still up and there still are Ember add ons. Um, but, you know, like estate management and tons of the different things that you mm -hmm. have in Ember came from the community and building through through these Ember add-ons. And I remember the format of the talks was always, this is a hard problem. You know, so you talk about this hard problem for like 15 minutes yes. and then you're like, okay, well, that's how you solve it. But here you go, I build this add-on for you so you don't have to do it. So I almost feel like your all's talks is like, okay, let's talk about this hard problem and solving it. And then here you go, by the way, like, let's not even think about that anymore. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, um, that's amazing. Well, I love that. Um, so what tips do you have for people? You know, I mean, I think, I think people like really look up to the work you've done and kind of like what you've done for the community um, and want to do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, I'm a normal human being <laughs> that does normal human things. Uh, maybe I'm a little stubborn, uh, you know, and I, and I think a part of it is maybe stubborn or delusional. You have to be delusional a little bit because you always have to think that things are easier than they actually are. Yeah. Because if you knew how hard things were, you'd be like, I want to do that. Yes, yes, you know, yes. If yes. people knew how much work it is to have kids, I don't think anybody would have kids. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. Um, so you have to have this little bit of a, of, a, of a delusion and thinking like, oh, the problem is simpler than this. But yeah. I think fundamentally the thing that you're building or trying to solve has to be something that you deeply care about uh -huh. and it is something that solves your own problem, right? Like mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you have to be solving a problem for yourself because only then do you really understand the nuance and the need and what works, what doesn't. You know, if you're mm -hmm. just generally solving a problem for somebody else, you just don't have the experience to, um, to even know what issues are to be solved. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, uh, that's, I feel like, you know, again, reflecting, I just had a conversation with Jeff like a week ago, which is why it's like fresh in my mind, but him talking about like mono repos and why he's like trying to evangelize mono repos is because, you know, he's been through, uh, the pain and the struggle and like really wants to evangelize these best practices. And I think, you know, kind of same thing for you, right? Like you want to solve, you want to solve your own problem and you want to kind of take it, take it to the next level. Yeah. And it's also interesting that the, the industry is moving, you know, forward. Uh, if I think about monorepos, monorepos were not a thing. If you go back five, 10 years ago, you know, Google right. was the crazy company who had a monorepo and like, yeah, what's wrong with Google? Why are yeah. they doing the same stuff as everybody else? Right. And now we're slowly getting to that point. Now, minor rep is not an answer for everything, but in many yeah. cases, it is the right thing. And there are definitely benefits uh, to be had. Right. And, you know, of course, if you use minor repos, then you have to have certain tools like build systems. And yeah. And then, you know, that's where index comes in <laughs> and, and builder, uh, sorry, uh, Bazel and other tools, et cetera. Well, I think one of the things that really um, was, you know, <laughs> seeing quick being built, right. And seeing, you know, seeing you, you know, go over and, and focus on quick full time. It was crazy to me. So, you know, I talk a lot about developer relations, right. And, um, you know, how does a framework get adopted or a technology get adopted? And, um, it wasn't until I feel like quick didn't really take off until you started saying yes to every single thing. <laughs> like you were ever, you went to every single conference, you were everywhere, you know, all at once. Right. And then all of a sudden I feel like quick, you know, became something that was on the map right now, all of a sudden, you know, it's like, you're talking about all these new things and quick has a seat at the table. Whereas before you did that, I don't feel like that actually happened. 
Yeah, no, that's an important part of mm -hmm. it. Um, you know, first you have to build it and that takes time. And so it's good to talk about it, but at the same time, people, um, they don't really understand it. And it's not really their fault because you don't have sufficient amount of examples, et cetera, to kind of show them, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the way we learn as humans is that we learn through examples. And mm -hmm. so to come in and write a blog post and like, I'm solving this problem through this thing, it is so abstract, so over the people's heads, right? There is almost no chance that anybody really gets it because as humans, that's not how we work, right? right. We work through examples. So, so you have to first build something that actually works, et cetera. And only then can you go around and start evangelizing. And you know, evangelization is an important thing. Um, I always say this, tell the story that <clears throat> people think that, that, that uh, when you have a good idea, others will steal it from you. Uh -huh. I don't think that's the case at all. Uh -huh. If you have a good idea, you can tell it to everybody and people will find faults in it and tell you why it's a bad idea, why it's never going to work, etc. Um, you really have to work on people and spend a lot of effort for them to kind of go like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe I should yeah. take it. <laughs> or see your success and be like, well, obviously yes. that was a great idea. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it goes back to this world of like, is it about execution or is it about the ideas? Yeah. And I am very firmly in the camp of it's it's 95% execution. Mm, um, mm. Idea is important. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. You know, if it's a bad idea, like it's unlikely to be successful, etc. But there is a huge chasm between an idea or a vision of what could be yeah. and actually making it a reality. And that's yeah. the hard part. It's all about the execution um, to, to kind of make it a reality. And that, that's, that's really... Have you changed like from, you know, from, from the beginning, right? Like from what you thought you set out to do with quick to now has, has anything changed? Oh yeah. Lots of things have changed. I mean, originally we just wanted to build a framework. Like my original, original thing was like, can I build this, but reuse an existing framework on top of it? Mm -hmm. So I looked into react angular lit just about every framework you can, can think of. And I was just trying to be like, can I just use the existing thing and just give him this thing underneath it? Mm. And it turns out it's such a fundamental shift that it doesn't work. Mm. And so then we were essentially forced to saying like, okay, let's build our own templating system and our own thing. And this is why we chose JSX. Mm -hmm. And once you chose JSX, then you're like, well, we should probably make it look like React because it's popular. Um, you know, it's a mental model people will understand and so on and so forth. Recording and so then you change about how you talk about it. You first mm -hmm. are talking about this thing called resumability or lazy loading and people get, you know, people, a lot of what happens is people always try to relate what they know to what they already know, right? Like mm -hmm. so you say like, oh, we do lazy loading. And they're like, oh, well, I can do lazy loading in React. And you go like, <laughs> well, you're not wrong, right? Like, <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah. But that's not what we had in mind. And so you have to tweak your delivery of mm. like, what do you talk about it and what resonates with people, you know, to kind of, kind of get it. Also, you know, a lot of it is explaining the problem, you know, doing demos saying like, look, this is the problem that you might have. Uh, and a lot of people are like, yeah, hey, I get this problem. I've had this before. Yeah. You know, and then you can talk about it like, well, you know, let's look at a different solution. Let's look at a different way of looking at it. So over the, over the many months, we definitely changed how we talk about, um, quick, what the value proposition of Quick is, etc. Now that the framework of the technology has changed underneath it, mm -hmm. it's just to kind of <clears throat> get better at explaining mm. to people what it is so that people can have the aha moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I think about technology generally, I look at, you know, why, why is React so popular, right? React is so popular because all of a sudden all the boot camps are using it, you know? And so, yeah. I mean, it's one of the reasons, right? But it's like, you know, you have that junior level adoption of how, you know, how somebody gets onboarded, let's say into JavaScript um, and, you know, all the problems that y'all are trying to solve are problems that senior developers, architects, you know, those types of folks who have a lot of experience are trying to solve. But what's really interesting, you know, in having produced tons of content through this thought is, you know, the most popular content, the most views, the most eyes is always from the beginner stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so but, you know, then you look at the like you look at the, uh, you know, the 
the hard problems, you know, like the advanced content that we put out and there might be less views, but like the people who are really, really searching for that are the ones that, you know, matter. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious how that from an, from an adoption perspective, um, affects, affects the adoption generally. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, I think AngularJS was super simple to get started. Mm -hmm. You <laughs> drop the script into your head and off you went. And I think we lost sight of that with Angular. I think Angular became complicated and, you know, hindsight's 2020, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think um, React gained popularity because React in many ways was very simple to get started with. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I, I think React got right is the mental model. It is really easy to explain to a beginner, as you point out, you know, how on a high level it works. You know, you don't have to go yeah. into the details, but like you get a correct mental model of the thing pretty quickly. And so I think those are the learnings that I kind of understood well from Angular JS and Angular days and, and the popularity of React. And so we worked really hard to make sure that the quick mental model is also relatively straightforward and simple so that yeah. you, know, you could get started just by doing npm create quick at latest and you can also go and just be productive from day one without having to jump through complicated set of hoops uh, etc yeah <clears throat> yeah i want to take a quick break and just give a shout out to our sponsor this dot my team who lets me do these crazy things these ideas i have <laughs> talking to interesting people. Uh, we're a development consultancy, 100% remote and worldwide. And we get to work with really amazing people like Stripe, Zero, Wikimedia, DocuSign, Cloudinary. Um, so if you need help, whether it's application development or upgrading legacy systems, done a lot of AngularJS to Angular upgrades, of course, or AngularJS to Vue, AngularJS to whatever. <laughs> but anyways, if you, if you need any of that help, um, you know, our engineering team is awesome and fun. Um, so, we're fun. Does that matter? It matters. It matters. <laughs> Absolutely. It matters. We care. Everyone wants to do boring stuff. <laughs> but anyways, you can check us out. This is dot dot co. It's T-H-I-S-D-O-T dot C-O. Um, so, Mishko, what is next? I mean, you're so deep in it. You probably don't know what's next, right? But, like, what's the goals for Quick? Like, when are you going to say... I was successful. I can, I can leave and do the next thing. Uh, I am very, very serious that this is going to be the last framework. <laughs> I know I said this before. Uh, you know, in a few it. years, there's going to be another problem. I mean, with the way the platform is evolving, right? Like even just talking to Ben about, you know, RxJS and like observable in the browser, like how on earth is RxJS going to change mm -hmm. with all of this? You know, you're going to have another problem to solve. I think, um, <laughs> I think I've stayed with AngularJS and Angular actually too long. I think um, I should have let go earlier. Um, Before I mean, I Angular? Both. Really? Both of them. Mm. And like, for example, I think Angular team right now are doing phenomenal job. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. Great work. Uh, lots of ideas, <clears throat> the things that they've done with, well, obviously finishing Ivy, but also like the signals and the direction they want to take it, etc. I think it's absolutely great. Um, with with Quick, I, I think we are kind of already there uh, in a sense that both Manu and Adam um, are kind of owning most of it. I'm more of a, uh, a social butterfly <laughs> to go to conferences these days to, to bring, build awareness. Um, and it, the, the, goal, the goal is to get quick to a you know, self-sustaining kind of a world and uh, have the community involved in it, et cetera. You know, just like AngularJS, all the good parts of AngularJS in it. But I don't see myself uh, you know, long-term with it because I, I would like to focus on other things. Um, yeah. One of the things is you know, we're building, Builder.io is building headless visual CMS. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we are investing time and effort into into Quick is because we need uh, our customers uh, are usually e-commerce customers and their biggest problem is the fact that their sites are too slow in terms of startup performance, right? And that directly impacts the profits that they have. And so they're, they're under great stress and pressure to improve these things and they're struggling. You know, they're, they, 
there is all this great content out there on how to make your application fast and all these things, and they're putting time and effort into it, and they're just not seeing the results that they're hoping for. And so this is why you know, we're working on Quick is because fundamentally, I think what's happening is that as a developer, you are fighting the framework, right? You are, you know, by default, the framework wants to be slow because of how they work, because of how hydration works and how re-rendering works, et cetera. And so you're fighting it, you know? If you look at the APIs that the frameworks have for performance, all of these APIs are in the form of like pruning the branches of the work that needs to be done, right? So as a developer, it's your responsibility to kind of tell the framework like, you don't have to do this, right? You to kind of simplify the work and make it go faster. And I think that's fundamentally backwards. Like, <clears throat> you know, as a developer, I don't want to do this. I want to just focus on the application. The framework should figure this out. And I think there's many things that has happened since, you know, the beginnings. And I think the biggest thing is signals because signals in, in a lot of way enable the framework to have a much better understanding of what's going on and then provide these kind of performance improvements. But signals by themselves are not enough uh, because even if you use signals, as long as you have hydration, the, the, the hydration requires full execution of the tree at the very beginning. And so you need something like code extraction, something like resumability to kind of flip this uh, on its head and make it go faster. Um, so this is the reason why we're doing this is because at the end of the day, we want to help our customers. And you know the idea is that like, hey, here's a framework that performs better. You don't have to think about it as hard. And now you can build better sites uh, with it. And of course, you know, at some point you're going to say, I need a CMS system to go with my, my e-commerce website. And you say, well, we happen to have one. And you know, we can sell you that as well uh, to kind of make it together. Actually, that kind of reminds me, <clears throat> it's an interesting world we live in where we've kind of learned that open source is free, but it really isn't free. You know, somebody somewhere is spending time and energy on building this. And on the end of the day, that somebody somewhere needs to be housed, fed, he has a family, or, you know, they have a family or she has a family, and they need to be paid for the family and et cetera, put the kids through college, et cetera, right? Uh, so it isn't really free. And so the question is like, well, who's paying for this? Um, and uh, it, it's interesting to me that when you start talking about money, people almost go like allergic on you. It's like, it's open, so it's supposed to be free. It's like, yeah, but somebody somewhere is fitting the bill, right? Um, I require food to it's function. It's so true, yes. Yeah. I require a place to live. You know, I require to feed my kids. <laughs> so right. somebody's got to pay for this. Yeah. Um, even if it's, if, it's, if it's free. And so I think as an industry, we really need to get better at, you know, I am all for having open source in the sense that hey, let's work on it in the open. Let's share our learnings. Let's make sure that everybody can benefit from this. Yeah. But at the same time, have a way of contributing back. You know, if yeah. you're a large company that is, you know, enjoying this technology and it's making a huge impact for you and you are, as a result, increasing your profits, right. then there should be a way of giving back. And the problem right now is that there isn't really a way to do that. Mm hmm you know, let's say you're a big company and you want to do the right thing and you want to write a check to somebody. How exactly do you do that? Like, you can't just go to <coughs> some contributor. Patreon. Like GitHub, yeah, right? uh, GitHub sponsorships. <clears throat> it's not that simple. Yeah. And, you know, it's, even if, if there are ways, as you point out, it is not in the culture yet. Yeah. Yeah. And so the direction I really would like to see is to have sustainable open source. Yeah. You know, that, yes, I want this to be open and I want people to tinker and see how the stuff is built and be able to use it in the project. And if it's, you know, for your, you know, simple whatever, then you, by all means use it for free. Right. But yeah. then if you get huge amount of benefit of it, there yeah. should be a way for you to contribute back. Yeah. And today there really isn't a way to yeah. contribute back. I mean, I think, I think like, uh, especially in JavaScript, I don't know if it's because, you know, it's so new or, you know, the excitement of JavaScript didn't really start until what, 2015 or so, right? When finally like ES 2015 standards were coming out and there was this like revolution happening. Um, at least that's what I, I felt like I saw. <laughs> um, then, you know, our industry is a little bit more 
kind of like, oh, no, you, it's taboo, right? But then you go to all these like, you know, DevOps or backend conferences <clears> or whatever. And like, of course, there's a vendor. Of course, the, there's all these vendor dinners because the vendors are paying. And for some reason, I don't know if it's because like that, it's probably because that industry has like grown up a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, yes, let's talk business. Yes, let's talk about your, your tool, your product and, you know, whatever it is. Um, so I think our industry is moving there, though. Um, you know, you're starting to see a lot of like creators figure out how to get paid, uh, you know, instead of, oh, my gosh, you can't do that. You can't do sponsored, whatever. And I think the evolution of, uh, you know, Instagram and creators and, you know, you know, you, you, if you think about like these YouTube kids, you know, opening opening toys and getting paid a million dollars a year, right? Like you look at those things and you're like, well, why can't we do it too? So <laughs> I think it's happening, but I think it's, you know, I think it's like another, you know, five years of evolution for, for us in the, in the front end world. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. I actually so, think you know. we would see a, a bigger explosion of mm -hmm. OSS. You know, if we could figure out a way to better support uh, people who do OSS. I think we would just see yes. more OSS and we would see more benefits. Et yes. I mean, I think um, Evan Yu, for example, with the view team and him being able to go out and, you know, get a Patreon and be successful with the Patreon mm -hmm. and be super thoughtful about what he's doing and, you know, not be um, tied to the, um, <laughs> you know, goals and objectives of another company, right? Like just focus on, Yes. Building cool things and have companies sponsor him through Patreon and um, I don't know what other forms specifically VGS does it. He's been able to do things like Veet, for example, right? Like doing mm -hmm. Veet really well. I don't think you get to see that as much or see like such a functional team in open source. You know, yeah, I think he's a he's an exception in that sense. Yes. Because like Veet is the only thing that is not backed by an actual company, right? Right. Right, All right. the other frameworks, uh, there is a benevolent corporation yes. that is fitting the bill. Yes. Right? And there is yeah. a cost to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so Mishka, where do we find you online? Like if people want to contact you or learn more about you? Uh, I don't know what it's called these days. Twitter <laughs> X or something? I don't know. <laughs> uh, M. Heavery is uh -huh. kind of the, the, the place to be. The other place to go and find us is on a Discord. If you uh -huh. go to quick.builder.io slash chat, mm -hmm. then that redirects you to our Discord channel. That's the other place to find me. Um, awesome. Yeah, I try to have an open door and talk to everybody because I always want to learn from people. So yeah, go yeah. reach out to me and say hi. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me.